This is the 14th lecture on algebra for students of MS 2014 and MS 3014 at University College Cork. In this lecture, we'll think about Galois theory. Let's consider an example of a field. We write Q with root 2 added to it, extended by root 2, to mean, of course, exactly just the numbers that look like a rational, plus a rational multiple of root 2, where B and C are rational numbers. And it's easy to see that this is a field, and that's why we write it with these round brackets. It's actually the field given by adding the root 2. Um, we could have written it with square brackets to say that it's polynomials that uh, allow a root 2 added to them. Um, so it's easy to see, for example, that if we try to divide, um, we'd get something like this. We can rationalize denominators. And this way, the denominator is a rational number, and um, and so and this is still a number that looks like this form. So we can write it as a number of this form, um, say rational number um, plus minus c over b squared minus 2c squared times root 2. And so it has still this same form, a rational plus a rational multiple of root 2. Uh, so you can see then that it's possible to take reciprocals inside this thing. It's easy to see that if you multiply two such things together, you get another such thing. And if you add two such things together, of course, you get another such thing. So it does form actually a field inside the real numbers. So q of root 2. Is, uh, is, is a collection of real numbers forming a field and, of course, containing, extending the rational numbers. And as a simple example of an automorphism, if you take any element of that field and you replace it by its conjugate in some sense, it's something like complex conjugation, uh, you can check that that actually uh, is, a, is an automorphism of the field, that products are taken to products, sums to sums. And, of course, that it's also a... Um, one to one and on to. E every automorphism of commutative rings will preserve all the structure of the rings, in particular, it'll preserve reciprocals where they exist. It'll preserve zero, it'll preserve a one if there's a if it's a commutative ring of one. Um, uh, so you can you can check all that rather easily as exercises, which I won't worry about. Let's just see uh, some simple examples of, of, of constructing uh, more automorphisms. So let's let automorphism of, of a ring be the set of automorphisms. So that's all the automorphisms, which are maps R to R, um, ring automorphisms. Um, so we'll write that as odd R. And we can come up with some simple examples. Um, it's a lemma. Let's prove that uh, the automorphism group of, say, the integers is uh, just 1. I'll write 1 takes R to R for the obvious identity morphism, the morphism that doesn't do anything, leaves everything where it is. 1 applied to any element R is that element R. And um, the automorphisms of the rational numbers are the same, also 1, and the automorphisms of the real numbers are 1. And also the automorphisms of Z mod PZ uh, that our, fav our other favorite field our only finite field that we really like to work with, that we have a good name for anyway, um, is the same. So these all have trivial automorphisms only. So to prove this, um, I said as an, as an exercise, you can prove that um, that an automorphism will have to take uh, 0 to 0, and it'll have to take 1 to 1. But then it follows that it also, since it preserves addition, it has to take 1 plus 1 to f of 1 plus f of 1, and f of 1 is 1. So it takes 1 plus 1 to 1 plus 1, and so f of 2 is 2, f of 3 is 3, and so on and so forth. Then we write 1, 2, 3, and so on for the various sums of 1 plus 1 plus 1, and so on. Um, but it also has to take differences to differences. And so f of uh, 0 minus n, well, so we could say f of n is n, where n means 1 plus to the dot plus 1 n times in our ring, whichever ring we're working. Um, and so f of 0 minus n is f of 0 minus f of n. So that's to preserve subtraction. Again, that's a, an easy exercise for you to do. And this is preserve 0. And so that says, well, f of minus n is minus f of n. And so it has to take uh, f of minus n to minus f of n um, 
which is n minus n, um, and so f uh, has to fix all the fixes all uh, of the uh, one, uh, well, zero, one, one plus one, and so on, but also fixes minus one, minus one, minus one, da -da -da, and so on. So it fixes all of those quantities. And since z mod p z is just exactly the integers. Um, but it's the image of the integers when you mod out by p, everybody in it is one of these. And so it fixes uh, everything. So any, uh, that says that any automorphism f of z mod p z would have to fix everything. And so it would just be 1. And similarly, it also says that any automorphism of the integers would have to be uh, trivial, have to be the identity automorphism, because this thing fixes everything that looks sort of like an integer. In other words, everything that's like looks like a positive integer, a bunch of ones from the ring added together, or the negatives of those, the the um, the minuses of those under the minus sign. So uh, so that gives us all those objects. And similarly, f of b over c, if b is some um, is some ones added together. Uh, plus or minus, and then C is some plus or minus some ones added together in the ring, right, in whatever ring we're working in. F of B over C has to be F of B over F of C, if that makes sense. If the expression B over C is, is, is well defined in our in our ring, then, uh, but then we said that any of these kinds of elements have to be fixed, so that would have to be B and that would have to be C. And that tells us, therefore, that um, that the automorphisms of the rationals, any automorphism of the rationals has to be just the identity automorphism because it would have to fix that, the rational numbers. And so we've got everything but the real numbers. The real numbers are much trickier. In some sense, we have to do analysis to deal with the real numbers. Um, so suppose we have an automorphism f takes real numbers to real numbers. And, um, and, and f is, of course, uh, having to be the identity on q. It's the operation 1 on, on the rational numbers. Now, we can just say that in, uh, we'd want to describe in terms of ring operations. We want to say that f preserves all the ring operations. And so we want to talk about the real numbers in terms of ring operations, if we can. One thing we can say about a real number is that a real number is positive if and only if it's equal to the square of some number, s, uh, real number and it's not zero. So being positive is precisely being the square, having a square root. Um, and that's an algebraic uh, statement. So that means in particular that's preserved by f. Positivity has to be preserved by any automorphism because the property of being a square <coughs> is a purely algebraic property. It preserves multiplications, so it has to preserve squaring f, so it has to preserve the property of something being a square. And so we can say that it must preserve positivity but then it preserves subtraction, and so um, must preserve. Um, we have this automorphism f the real numbers to the real numbers. It preserves um, uh, uh, preserves uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication. Uh, preserves zero, preserves one. But we've also discovered that now it preserves positivity. Um, so it must preserve the greater than sign. Uh, preserved because why? Because that's true if and only if x minus y is positive, and so it must preserve the ordering. So uh, f on any automorphism preserves order. Um, so what we wonder is, does it preserve something like limits? Well, we can say that a uh, the absolute value of a number is um, said to be is just uh, x if x is positive and automorphisms for positivity, so they have to preserve that. They can, that the equation makes sense, and then, um, and then it would also be, of course, minus x if x is uh, less than well, let's say greater than or equal to zero, less than zero. So we can um, we can therefore define uh, this absolute value sign. It's defined in terms in terms entirely of positivity and and arith arithmetic, and so it has to be preserved by f f of the absolute values, the absolute value of the f's. So now what we can say is that um, some uh, numbers xi approach a limit f if and only if um, for every delta greater than 0 there exists an epsilon, there exists, or sorry, there exists an n uh, greater than 0 um, so that the absolute value of xn minus x is less than delta. 
in that whole statement, all of this is just now described in terms of arithmetic operations because we said we could describe positivity in terms of arithmetic uh, of the delta, and then we could describe the less than sign or greater than sign in terms of the arithmetic as well, and we could describe the absolute value sign. So everything in here has to be invariant or f, and so xi approaches x if and only if f of xi approaches f of x because all those operations are invariant under f and therefore f is continuous because that's what continuity means and we know that f is uh, well f of x is x for x rational and now we can take limits of rational approximation of any real number and so f of x is x for all x in the real numbers by taking limits and therefore f is the identity operation in the sense of being an identity automorphism of rings. So now we can work out the automorphism groups of some other structures in terms of these. So as an example, we can say, well, as a, let's say as a lemma or lemma or example, that the automorphism group of um, the rationals with root 2, uh, extended by root 2, is exactly, uh, consists of the identity automorphism and then the automorphism, which is uh, the conjugation that we wrote down before, uh, which was, of course, the, the conjugation operation on B plus uh, C root 2, B and C rational, uh, was defined to be B minus C root 2. So, um, and, and the proof of that is, is not too hard. Um, the automorphisms, um, we take an automorphism, uh, so that's got to be a map from root q root 2 to q root 2, and it must be, um, it, e it must equal 1 on q. Um, so what we can say, therefore, is that f of uh, any um, element must be, well, it's got to preserve addition and multiplication, so, and it's got to preserve q, b is in q, so it's got to preserve b, and then it's got to preserve c, and then it's got to be f of root 2, because it has to pass right through all the arithmetic in here, hitting the b, the c, and the root 2, but on the rationals, it's the identity, and b and c are rational. So it looks like that, and so is determined, so f is determined completely by knowing f of root 2. What does it do to root 2? But um, it, it has to satisfy some equation uh, that, well, f of root 2 squared is, well, let's say, maybe we should say root 2 squared is 2. It's the equation we're going to start with here. Um, root 2 squared is 2. And so f of root 2 squared is f of 2, but f fixes the rational, so that's 2. And that's got to be f of root 2 squared. And so that means there's only, in the rationals, only, oh no, in the, in, sorry, in the reals, um, there are, I remember that, that our field sits inside the real numbers. And in real numbers, there's only one square of, uh, square root of 2, except up to, up to plus and minus sign. And so f of root 2, because it squares 2, has to be plus or minus root 2. And therefore, we are, we've worked out the, uh, the automorphism group. Remember, this root 2 we're dealing with here is not some abstract extension. It's actually the ordinary root 2 inside the real numbers. Um, so that gives us uh, the result. But if you did abstractly add a root 2, you can easily prove it had to be isomorphic, your field extension, to this one. And so even an abstract root 2 would give you the same story as we got here, the same automorphism group. In, in many instances, we're really interested in, um, in, uh, ex in field extensions and not the automorphisms of the whole extended field, but just of those which, 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 uh, which somehow exhibit the, the extending. Um, so we're interested in what are called Galois groups so of k over little k as a field extension. That is, that when I write k over k uh, as a field extension, what I mean, of course, is that k containing k is a subfield. Um, and it's a traditional notation to write k over k um, to mean that k is, is a field lying over little k. In other words, it's, that it contains it as a subfield. Um, then we let ought of k over k be the set of automorphisms of the big field that fix every element of the little field. So the little field is going to stay fixed. We're not interested in all automorphisms, just the special ones that, that are trivial on, on the subfield. Now we've already seen, uh, as an example, that when we added a square root, um, the automorphisms of Q of root 2 all fixed q and so the automorphisms of q of root 2 over 
q are exactly the same as just all the automorphisms of q of root 2. They all already fix q. And so that's our, our notation here. One field over the other automorphisms means I want the automorphisms of the big field that fix the small field, but these ones all do anyway. Uh, if we have some polynomial p of x in k of x in the little field, um, and, uh, and g is an automorphism, of the big field uh, module, the little field, um, where uh, the well uh, of any any big field, um, then what we can say is that G, the automorphism applied to P of X, applied by applying it to all of its all the way through all of its coefficients, is exactly P of X because it fixes all the coefficients because B, P was in the little field. It's a polynomial in the little field, and and, and the automorphism that we're uh, morphisms we're dealing with have to fix the little field. So they fix all the coefficients of this guy. So they fix this guy, and so G takes um, that acts on the big field, and so it takes roots in the big field. Big field roots of p of x to one another to one another it's a permutation you could say of the of the of the roots in the big field for example in our in our um, favorite example q of root 2 we found that the automorphisms were just taking root 2 to itself that was the identity automorphism or we had the other automorphism which was um, this conjugation automorphism which took roots 2 to its negative, and once you know where these roots are going, these are the roots of the polynomial p of x is x squared minus 2. Any automorphism uh, of the big field fixing the little field is going to fix this polynomial because it's just got rational number of coefficients, but therefore it's going to swap the roots or preserve the roots. It's a permutation of the roots of that polynomial. Galois extension. capital K over little k, is a field extension uh, for which little k is, um, for which little k is, uh, is, uh, is, is the set of elements fixed, is the set of elements of big K fixed by the automorphisms or Galois group. Because in general, what we might find is that, is that the, the, uh, we, as by definition, our, our automorphisms had to be trivial on the little field. These automorphisms had to be trivial in this little field, but they might be actually trivial on something much larger, and that would be kind of bad. That would show that this, we're in a sort of degenerate situation where we haven't really made the little, the, the little field as big as it should be. We want to make it exactly be uh, the stuff that's fixed by the Galois group. So as an example, again, our, um, our square root 2 example, um, q over root 2 over q, that's Galois because of the q's are exactly the fixed things. Then we found this automorphism, which b plus c root 2 went to b minus c root 2, and that flips the sign on the c, so it's fixed just exactly when there's no c, exactly when it's just b, and that's just exactly when it's rational. So I want to do one... Uh, example that's a bit more involved um, of of a field uh, extension where we can see that this doesn't work the way we might like to. Um, so we'll let k equal q of cube root 2. This will be just the usual real cube root 2. And so this guy is contained in the real numbers. What we've done is to add the cube root 2 in with the rationals and take the field it generates. And I'm going to claim that that's exactly the elements of the form a plus b 2 to the 1 3rd plus C 2 to the 2 thirds, uh, such that A, B, and C are rational. And we've said this before, I, I didn't go through the details, that this is a field, um, uh, because actually working out the reciprocal operation for this thing is a bit complicated, and then proving that it really is a field, that it has such a reciprocal defined for anything that's not zero, is also quite complicated. And that's done in the notes, but I don't want to do it at great, in, in great detail. I don't think it's worth spending a lot of time on it. What I want to do is to is to think about what what are its automorphisms. Well, um, so what are its automorphisms as an extension of the rationals? So if we fix the rationals, and we know we already actually have to fix the ra the rationals in any extension anyway, so that'll just be automorphisms of the field. Um, we know there's only one 
real root of the polynomial p of x is x cubed minus 2. There's only one real root, and that is um, alpha equals uh, exactly 2 to the 1 third. So what we find is that um, that uh, if we were to um, to have an automorphism of automorphism of k mod k um, some automorphism, uh, well it'd have to act trivially on this because this guy has rational roots. So it acts trivially on the rationals. So it acts trivially on this. So g p of x is p of x. It does it just fixes everything there, and so therefore g fixes those roots, and the roots of p of x but inside the bigger field. But the bigger field is a field of real numbers. After all, it's the field of, let's go back to its definition, we're dealing with the field here which is given by adding the real cube root of 2 into the rationals. That's a real number. Those are, rationals are real numbers, so they end up inside real numbers. These are all real numbers. Um, so what, what have we got? Then it fixes this guy inside here. But then, um, so it fixes everything. It fixes all of all of k. Why? Because it has to fix the cube root of 2, send it to itself, because there's only one, uh, one cube, real cube root of 2. It has to make the, uh, these, these real valued uh, quantities to themselves by an automorphism. It has to take roots to roots. There's only one such root, so it has to do that to that. And therefore, squaring it, it has to take this to itself. And of course, it has to take rationals to themselves, and so it's the identity. And so we find in this case the the the, the, the strange fact that the automorphisms uh, are exactly well, the automorphisms of the whole field are exactly one. So it doesn't have a very large automorphism group. So that's kind of bad. And therefore, we could say that it, this is not a Galois extension. So k over q is not Galois because it fixes not just the automorphisms fix not just the little k they fix the whole thing um, and and that's that's sort of not allowed it's kind of a degenerate situation the galois group is too small the galois group is too small so we'll be interested in extensions for which the galois group is is actually a good size so let's look at at a at a way to fix this particular example um Let's suppose we're interested in k is the, the splitting field of um, of this same polynomial. It was the same one we just had in our previous example, x cubed minus 2, uh, splitting field over q. And it's certainly not the one we just had. It's not the field we just were looking at because it has to have all three roots. And in the complex plane, those roots are somewhere over here, somewhere up there, and somewhere down there. These three legs should all be the same length. They don't look the same length. Maybe make that a little bigger so that these three would be the same length. Um, their lengths should, of course, be cube root three, cube root two. So it's two to the one third. And then this guy is some complex number. This some complex number. This some, uh, somehow uh, splitting the thing into into equal thirds. Um, so there's some number which we can call alpha, and some number which we call alpha bar. And that those are our three roots. And so k must contain all of them. Um, contains 2 to the 1 third alpha and alpha bar. It's alpha bar because it's, of course, a complex conjugate of alpha. Um, and you can see the conjugation operation. The complex conjugation is one of the automorphisms. It's going to swap alpha and alpha bar. So ordinary complex uh, conjugation takes alpha to alpha bar, alpha bar to alpha, and then fixes the, oops, uh, it takes alpha to alpha bar, alpha bar to alpha, and it fixes, so it takes alpha bar to alpha, alpha to alpha bar, uh, but it fixes uh, the real guy. Um, so that's our, our nice example where we can see explicitly what the Galois group does, well, pretty explicitly. Um, the other um, Galois uh, group operations are more mysterious because uh, we know that, the, well, we, we'll say, we'll prove eventually that there should be some operation that takes this one to this one. Uh, that it should be possible to swap those somehow, which is which is a bit more mysterious. But it turns out that you have so there are other, again more mysterious um, uh, elements of the uh, well permutations. Um, but we will in fact prove that you can permute any one of them to any of the others, and in fact, uh, in fact, you get all uh, all permutations of. Uh, of alpha, alpha bar, and 2 to the 1 third can all arise inside the Galois group, in the uh, Galois group. 
which is the automorphism group of this extension over the rationals. So not obvious, but we can get those all to show up. And in particular, that means this is actually a Galois extension because um, only the uh, the rational numbers are all that's going to be fixed. These permutations will swap everything else around, and so we'll get it that this is actually a Galois extension. We've seen already what happened when we added a root 2, uh, something very simple, how the Galois group behaved. Um, in general, if we have k as a field, um, and we, uh, we look at some b and some c in k, some elements, we can look at the quadratic equation x squared plus bx plus c. We might as well rescale it to make it mnemonic. And then um, if the characteristic of k is not 2, for example, we know that there is a finite field of two elements. That would be bad. We can't do that. But any extension of that one would be bad, too. Um, yeah, but if it's not 2, then we can prove, and, and it's one of the exercises for you to try, that in fact the quadratic formula works, and it's 4c rather than 4ac because a is 1 here divided by 2. You have to divide by 2, and that's why things get bad if it's characteristic 2. In other words, if 2 is 0, remember that characteristic k is 2 if and only if 2 is 0 in k. And if 2 is 0, then you can't divide by it, and that's bad. So, but if you can divide by 2, then this, equa this equation works, as you can, you can check. And therefore, um, we can add a root by letting k equal the splitting field of this of this polynomial x squared plus bx plus c, adding all the roots we need to, to it. And those are the root, those are the roots right there. And so capital K is exactly little k, but with this thing added to it. And to add this thing, you really only need to add that. This is already in the field. You can already subtract and and, and, and divide by 2 and all that stuff happily. So the only thing you can't do is this. And so it's actually just given by b squared minus 4c. Um, so in particular, if um, if b squared minus 4c is a square already in, is a square in little k, then big K is little k. Um, but if uh, b squared minus 4c is not as 4c is not a square, then you get a an extension. You actually get an extension. But then the plus and minus is exactly the Galois group, the automorphism group of k over little k is exactly this plus and minus 1. It has a plus 1 and a minus 1. And it's exactly the choice of the sign here. It swaps the, the action of it swaps the 2. And it's just like this case we've seen already for the um, for square root 2. Now, of course, you could say, what happens if, it, if, if you can't divide by 2 and make the quadratic formula work? Then it turns out it's much more complicated. We won't worry about it. Um, so um, the main theorem, which I've alluded at already, which we will eventually prove, I think, if we have the time, um, is uh, the following. Um, if uh, capital K is a splitting field um, of an irreducible polynomial in one variable over um, some little field, little k, so let's say some, um, then, well, some say some irreducible p of x, then um, the automorphism group of k over little k permutes, well, any two roots of p of x. You can swap one with the other, so it's quite powerful. This is, in some sense, this is very, very large. In particular, uh, it implies that uh, it's a Galois extension. Um, again, we will prove that, hopefully, later on if we have the time. Um, so, uh, and, and, and finally, I, now that we've got a lot of information about fields, I want to point out a, a minor observation about many of the rings we've been we deal, we dealt with. They often have fields uh, uh, behind them in some sense. They're called algebras. Um, almost every ring we encounter has some way of multiplying by a field. Um, so, for example, we had n by n matrices over a field. We had polynomials over a field. We had rational functions over a field, and so on and so forth. Lots and lots of examples where we started with a field, then we built a larger ring out of the field. And that's the kind of thing we want to get at an algebra A over a field K is a ring 
with uh, an operation um, uh, which takes an element in the field and an element in the ring and multiplies them together uh, to give an element SA in the in the in the ring um, and called a scalar multiplication. Uh, so that uh, it has the obvious properties S A plus B is S A plus A S B R plus S. So two scalars times a, an element of the, of the times a vector should be um, R A plus R uh, plus S A. Um, and uh, R S A should be R S A. Um, and then um, these so far are just the just statements that it's really a vector space. This is just linear algebra statements. But now we need to multiply in the in uh, the algebra A, and it should be the same as scaling up A times B or A times scaling up B. And to remember these, basically they're, they're the the facts about about matrices that you already know when you multiply matrices by numbers. And also, obviously, one times A should be A. And this is for any what is it A B there's a C, no, A, B in the algebra, and then an R and an S in the in the field, something like that. So, um, so there's obvious scaling rules that you'd expect for these kinds of things. And so we'll have lots and lots of, of algebras. Um, and again, some more examples of algebras would be, um, so once you have this guy as a field, then you'd have examples like polynomials, polynomials in two variables, usually we're doing one variable, um, uh, n by n matrices, uh, form an algebra, multiply matrices, and um, and also uh, uh, the field extensions. The larger field is an algebra over the smaller field. And um, another example would be if A is an algebra, then you could take n by n matrices in A, and that's also an algebra. Um, or if uh, you could also take take your algebra and look at polynomials. We already did this with matrices. We took uh, matrices and we said, well, we could have polynomials with matrix coefficients, and that's an algebra over whatever field the matrix has its its co its entries in. In the last couple of lectures, the examples have been very, very abstract and algebraic. It would be nice if we could draw some pictures and from them uh, derive some interesting examples of, of rings and of, and of uh, fields and algebras. So in the next lecture, we'll think about algebraic curves in the, in the plane.